Hello and welcome to Wrestling and Everything Coast to Coast with your host, Buddy Satella Esquire, Evan Ginsberg. And because he needs a full introduction, Mike Leno, the first dentist in professional wrestling and the longest living photographer in wrestling today. We have as our... Well, I thought you were going to say some stuff, you know, more about Evan as well. I mean, Evan... No, not important. We don't have time on the show. We we we, we got to cut him off for our for our viewers that don't know. Doctor Mike, as a kid, was shooting Gotch Hackenschmidt. It was his first with gig. a pinhole with camera with well, one of those pinhole exactly. cameras. Or Tolis Blassi and Sheik Bobo Brazil, but that's okay. You know the uh, uh, you know the pterodactyl that would peck onto the uh, a slate in the Flintstones. That's how he took his pictures of. of <laughs> Um, did, you, did you take the picture behind you with... Uh, yep. Emil Moskers at the Hair versus Hair match against Bull Ramis, Apache Bull Ramis. That's your picture. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so we have two major topics for, uh, for this evening, and uh, one of which is uh, the recent WWE releases that they had. And I guess we could spend one minute on everybody, but I don't think we want to take that much of the show... Uh, just on them alone. They've released, they've released 71 people this year. That would take 71 minutes. That wouldn't work. But yeah. the crazy thing is, is just with who they released uh, early Friday, late Thursday night, late, late, I think they're trying to get it through so there'd be as little media coverage. You could form a wrestling company with just those names alone. Let me throw out just some of them. What was it, 18 or 19, guys? I think it was 19 18, or 18. 20. It was 18. It's a, it's incredible. Other than Eva Marie, who come on, let's face it, she really didn't know how to wrestle. But you know, beautiful girl and wrestling. A lot of it is about aesthetics. Keith Lee. This time it was spouses for the first time. Keith Lee, who so amazing on NXT, as was Mia Yim, who used to be, a, I think she was a two-time TNA Women's Champion, but you know, wasted wearing the mask and being part of that stupid group of of, of uh, you know, the the mass, I forget what they call it, retribution on the raw roster. So Keith Lee and Mia Yim, who they mishandled, and also Killer Carrion Cross and uh, his wife Scarlett, who they they had the best entrance in wrestling on NXT. They were absolutely incredible there, as were Keith Lee. Keith Lee, the most uh, acrobatic, athletic guy. They, you know, these talents, and I'll also throw out a person I know, Frankie Monet. She also has wrestled all over the world, particularly in Mexico. Triple A is Taya Valkyrie. She was the longest reigning Impact Women's Champion, or TNA for that matter, uh, and so many others. But Nia Jax, you know, Nia that, Jax, that's insane. Nia Jax, who what you know, she kind of had pushing the, dewdrop, and yet you know, Nia Jax doesn't have the talent. For them to well, she, had, she started having that reputation with Becky and with Charlotte uh, and even Alexa Bliss for injuring people, not intentionally, but, you know, and that has caused an alleged rift with the Anawahe Samoan family, that dynasty that's already there. She should have been thrown in with uh, Roman Reigns and that whole uh, brotherhood group, uh, you know, the mafia style group they had. But Again, none of these talents, and they're all incredibly talented, you know, with the exception of that one I mentioned, who most would not argue with. She just was, hadn't learned how to wrestle yet. She could have, but uh, they did not fail as wrestlers. The, the bookers, the writers uh, failed them, particularly on the main roster, because they're all, you could see what they can do in NXT. They were all nicely brought along by Shawn Michaels and, of course, Triple H. Fantastic. We don't even know what's going on with Steve Regal. I bet he's been let go. He's not even the, the fake GM of NXT. And he brought his credibility to that and, and made it, you know, that show is just now, it's so obviously it's a, uh, uh, for the most part, uh, a farm system and the established good talent like Johnny Gargano, et cetera, the few that they have, they're just put in positions to, for the most part, carry these un trained, you know, these fresh green faces that they're trying to get over. Some have promise, like uh, Rick Steiner's son and, and others, you know, will have promise, hopefully. But Evan, what do you have to say about it? it have, oh, go ahead, Evan. What, what I have to say is the 
fanboys who do a knee-jerk reaction. These 71 wrestlers that were released this year in the latest 18, 19, or 20 have no talent, they'll say. They failed, the fanboys will say. And what Mike just said is absolutely true. The, the writers, the bookers, the ironically named creative failed these people horribly, horribly. They were signed because they had the ability, they had the look, they had the charisma. And lost in all of this is WWE signing everybody and their mother so that other promotions wouldn't get their hands on them. And then it's like creative has nothing for you. Why don't you fire creative if they're not creative instead of the wrestlers who many relocated, turned their lives upside down, thought they had an opportunity and was squandered. And for one stupid fanboy after another, that's just the way it is in the business world. People get let go. No, no. Not that many. Not that many. It's, you know whose fault it is? It's this Nick Khan guy who Vince brought in. And he's just, and there's a, a ton more behind the scenes. Do you know the, the C, I guess she was the CFO who did that speech. I think it was Wednesday or Thursday during the uh, teleconference shareholders meeting. And she said that the company had their most profitable third quarter, you know, ever. Uh, they grossed well over 340 million, you know, was the report that I read. Uh, I didn't listen to it, but 340 and then later, after she did that, and I guess what the rumors are, is she found out all these people were going to be let go after she just said how profitable the company was. She quit. She turned in a resignation. They rep replaced her almost immediately with a man. Hmm. Don't See, you think that, that the WWE is a microcosm of corporate America right now as we see it for well, a lot this, of I, big companies? This, that this I think country. that's the other thing that makes it so difficult for a lot of Americans to stand by and just be, I mean, yes, I know there are fanboys and yes, they're making more money than they ever have before. But if you look at the hardcore wrestling community, I don't know for whatever that means, if that has any value anymore, you know, maybe we're all just kind of aging out and dying out. We're not in the demo anymore. You know, we're, we're past that area where you can make a lot of money off of just us any longer. And instead the real money is to be made off of the, the younger kids and appealing to, you know, the fanboys as you're talking about that are always going to be there to the WWE, no matter what. Um, I heard, you know, that the WWE is really saying that they're going to cut back on trying to find guys from the indies, like men they're not, and women. They're not going to whatsoever. They just want to bring them in like Rick Steiner's son, don't work any indies and train them the way they want to train them, the way Vince wants it. So that's all a thing of the past, the Triple H thing. Uh, and don't you think that's a huge mistake? Because that's like saying... With the, if you're the NFL, I'm not. We're not going to draft anyone from college anymore. We're just going to draft people that the NFL trains themselves. We had that mistake. Football. Evan and I and you, the three of us, lived through that, and I saw that transformation where they were picking up guys. You know, that's where Vampiro, for example, and many others came through. Some wrestling agent happened to be at a gym, or was specifically on intentionally at a gym, and just find these big, huge, tall guys, muscle bound guys. And, you know, Hey, you can make a lot of money in wrestling and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And we don't want that. I want to see the, 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 that was why NXT was the hottest commodity. And that made Vince allegedly kind of pissed. That was the hottest of the three shows they had. They're bringing in Samoa. This is where all those guys came from. We're working Samoa Joe Shinsuke, uh, Sammy Zayn, who was uh, El Generico, and Kevin Steen, now Kevin Owens. Pretty much anybody good was gobbled up the way uh, Russ. And not did. just the WWE, but AEW as well owes a lot to the to the indie scene. Well, kind of go yeah. after. Now we heard the perfect guy to come in and help the uh, the uh, whatever that thing is called, the Dark Order, that group. Uh, when uh, sadly uh, the leader passed away a little over a year ago, is now perhaps bringing in, um, his name is Wyndham Rotundo, named after uh, his dad, 
uh, Mike Rotunda's, you know, longtime Florida. And Barry Windham. Yeah, Barry Windham, and who was, uh, what was his character, the demon, and also Bray Wyatt. And th so they're thinking of bringing him in. So, hey, those guys, all of these great talents I mentioned, you know, from Taya Valkyrie on down, they're going to find work immediately uh, with either Impact or NWA Billy Corgan or obviously AEW that's going to go after a Braun Strowman. You can be sure he'll eventually end up either there or Impact. And since there's that so-called talent sharing, i.e. open door, they'll be on AEW. Uh, you know, if they're going to Impact initially, they're going to be on AEW like the Good Brothers, etc. Let me just say something about Bray Wyatt. I saw him headline the Garden against Reigns. I saw him headline the Garden uh, against Cena. The place was packed. He was totally over. Excellent matches. Next thing, he's in the opening match. The opening match, losing. And I'm like, what happened? What went wrong? What? What? You know, how do you how do you mess up Bray Wyatt? How do you mess that is, that's when they get punished. They've done something or they've stood up for themselves and then they get punished. And that's typically why that happens. You don't see AEW and they go into somebody's hometown versus WWE going into San Diego and having Ray Jr. lose and getting humiliated. Or how about home. Bailey losing in her title in San Jose? Yeah. Or Jim Ross getting humiliated in Oklahoma, getting, you know, bloodied by Steve Austin. I don't understand the thought process there. You would think you would want to make their hometown fans happy and more supportive of the company. They'll buy more merch. They'll attend more shows. No, if you piss them off, what is the point? These petty politics. You don't see that with a guy who cares about his wrestlers. I know he's only been around two years, a little over two years, but Tony Khan, AEW, that guy is a family guy, and he appears to all of us, to so many, as caring about his... Well, it's, it's a respect for the material itself. This is why cutting off the indies is such a bad idea. Earlier you know, in the year, Vince had to fire that one lady who uh, 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 was a, a comedy writer and had no idea, like... To how to even spell Bobby Lashley's name but or how to say just, it. Yeah, she didn't she say something really stupid like I've never watched wrestling before, but I'm gonna yeah. write she said something yes. dumb. But what and we wonder why, you know, the product is so damned awful. You're hiring people. I mean, it is like trying to hire somebody to build a car that has only built sailboats in their entire life. You know, you're not going to get somebody, you say, well, it's all television. You'd say it's all transportation. If you know how to build a boat, you probably know how to build a car. Not really. You know, find people that really have a passion. And that's one thing that Tony Khan does have is a passion and Billy Corrigan. I mean, God bless Billy Corrigan in a lot of ways. He doesn't spend anything on the NWA, but he still at least puts something out that tries to entertain the wrestling fan. And that's something we've really lost. Well, you know? what about what about plan B? Instead of overriding and having endless comedy that isn't funny, which is WWE's forte, I would just go, okay, okay. Okay, AJ Styles, go out there and wrestle Bray Wyatt for 30 minutes. Put on a killer match. Why do you need all the nonsense, the nonsense that they well, have? Vince hates wrestling. If you look at AEW, I go, man, every match last Wednesday and last Friday, you know, uh, the two different shows, was great. The Eddie Kingston, I am so involved in his character. He's like the realest guy, and he has that verbal spat that involved a lot of shoot legit elements with uh, CM Punk. It was incredible. It was off the charts. And uh, in the matches he's had, you know, he was able to keep up with Brian Danielson and, and some of these. Uh, and uh, Oh, man, it's every match is great. Uh, Suzuki coming in, thanks to Tony Khan, and now he's, you know, dipping his toe into all these indies here. I think he's spending most of the rest of this year here. He's been he was at that full impact taping, so he's going to be on the next X amount of shows. It's incredible. And Devil's Advocate, you know, we bitched about uh, when they, uh, with the, you know, the, the 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 talent when they were bringing in and stealing all of those uh, great superstar, you know, from the Indies and from New Japan, etc., and from Stardom for the women for NXT. You know, they're grabbing all of them. 
But now that they're letting them all go, you know, they've ruined the product and people are, you know, in contact. Well, but it's, what, the problem that I really have with it is that it's a tidal wave of all the, this town. It's one thing to release a wrestler here and there, you know, and then they can work into the work into the storylines of other feds. This is more like the Titanic crashing. They're doing it at the end of each quarter. This is what this Nick Khan, no relation, thank God, to Tony, is doing at the end of each quarter. Uh, staffers behind the scenes and on-air talent being released. You can only fit so many wrestlers into a storyline. And when you release 20 and 71 in a year, you can't possibly absorb them all. The lifeboats are full. You know, people are going to sink to the bottom of the ocean because there's no place for them. Well, let me ask you two, what was the most surprising of the names released last week for you guys? What was the most surprising? Lee, Lee for sure. And Nia Jax. Those two were the biggest surprises for me. I mean, especially because they'd just been pushing Lee as Bearcat. They have been pushing the hell out of him. They didn't have these vignettes that they were showing. Keith Lee coming soon. Uh, So-and-so coming soon. Keith Lee leaving soon. It should have been coming soon. They're pink slip. They're going. They're pink yes. slip. And, and Carrie and Cross, they'd run that vignette for like four weeks in a row. Coming soon. Leaving nope. soon. Yeah. They're all leaving soon, except the stale guys that have been there for 15 years. Those you know, are the guys they're keeping. Andrade, he sent out that tweet. We didn't know it a couple of days ago. He must have had a premonition or had some inside knowledge. He, he tweeted out FWWE. <laughs> Yes. And then a couple of days later, they released all these folks. He must have known what was what the shit was coming. F, F the corporate apologists that defend them no matter what. My, my blood pressure was skyrocketing when I saw all these fanboys go, all 71 of these wrestlers were not worthy. Can uh, you imagine the stupidity? The well, stupidity. And, and also on top of that... I'll give the WWE a little bit of bad, of negative credit, but intelligent credit is that they sent out the rumor, and I'm sure it was an organized thing, that a lot of these wrestlers didn't want to get vaccinated. When it was maybe about four of them, they turned the narrative into this rumor mill saying, no, all of these folks didn't want to get vaccinated. Oh, that was the fans. That was the fans going... It wasn't WWE, WWE's fault. All of the wrestlers didn't want to get vaccinated. That's nonsense. That's not true. But I'm sure that the, some WWE executive probably got the ball rolling on a burner account somewhere and said, yeah, yeah, that's the ticket. Sure, they didn't want to get vaccinated. No, no, Keith Lee got COVID, apparently, he wrote uh, last January, had a mild case or whatever, and got vaccinated. So I don't know if it was a breakthrough exactly. case. It was, it was maybe four of the, the, the 20 were doing that. And then the other, you know, 16 d- did get vaccinated or were willing to get vaccinated. But yet the there was an overwhelming number of people on the Internet that I saw in wrestling forums that were saying they all deserve to be fired because they all didn't want to get vaccinated. It's nonsense. And it is it. nonsense. But people started to believe that nonsense because that's the way the internet rumor mill works. And I'm sure the WWE is not doing anything to dissuade anyone from from believing that context. And you certainly haven't seen the WWE releasing anything saying, oh, wait a minute, you know, there were four wrestlers that didn't want to get vaccinated. Those are the ones that we we terminated for those reasons. Instead, it was a blanket. You know, we're just getting rid of them. You guys figure out why we got rid of them. Certainly, budget cuts. Well, I didn't see Vince McMahon, Stephanie McMahon, Shane McMahon, Triple H get one dime cut from their salaries. You cut a million dollars off of Vince McMahon's salary, and you can easily keep all those people and more and offer them health insurance. Let me throw this in, uh, since you mentioned Triple H. The guy has an estimated <laughs> estimated worth of $150 million, okay? So if every time you put your heart and soul into building a wrestler, building a show, building an angle, and your legs are cut out from under you, at some point, don't you say, let me prove myself on my own. There's no huge financial risk here. I'm worth $150 million. Let, 
let me go out on my own and, and instead of being the boss's son-in-law, the boss's daughter's husband. I mean, these guys, Triple H is on a committee that helps get rid of these guys that he created. I mm. mean, at what point do you say, I'm not doing this, Vince. This, this, this guy deserves better. This guy sold his house. This guy relocated. This guy took his kid out of school, you know, to get an opportunity. And, and look, basically, it, it, it's obvious. Vince wants to sell this thing at some point, make a zillion dollars, sail up into the sunset, golden parachute, what, whatever the case may be. I hope they can put him on a rocket somewhere. They should send, you know? they should send him into space like they did Shatner, but leave yeah, him up keep there. him there. Yeah, <laughs> but, but let me like, throw this out on a related thing: the John Moxley situation that was handled with class. But I like the fact that you have several wrestlers, Kylie Ray and others, who were talking about being stressed and needing time off. Or in Moxley's case, he was stressed. You can imagine this guy's main eventing. He's one of those helping carry the company. He's one of the top guys. Gets married. What? I forget if it was not even a year ago, has the baby recently, has the book out, all of these press duties and stuff. He was going to do a ton of press this week as his book came out, I think Monday or Tuesday. And uh, so he entered uh, rehab, stressed out for alcohol and fans showed their support and love. Tony Khan released a very classy statement and I hope more wrestlers because they do need time off. They can't just go, go, go. Like this Roman Reigns who saw them injured or Cena. Who, I, I don't think 50 that, days. But... Someone made a movie about it. Yeah. All 350 yeah. days. I don't know who that is. Yeah, no, speak, it's speaking, it's speaking of which, uh, speaking of which, um, King Kong Mosca passed and he was one of the stars of our movie. Mm. That's true too. Well, we'll get let's, into that. But let's, let's finish up talking about the, uh, uh, the you know everything that's going on with the WWE and it's and it's you know uh, is it a death spiral because you know they always seem to they made forty million dollars you know in the last quarter and, and profits are oh, up and hundred and forty million hundred and forty pardon me pardon me and they had to make budget cuts. They had to make budget cuts on $140 million worth of profit. Is there something wrong with that? Is there? I think it's interesting that Survivor Series is in two weeks and, and you basically don't know any of the matches. There's no promotion. There's no nothing. It's just hey, like... The wrestlers that are still there, they're the survivors. Yeah. 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 Yes. It's like, yes. It's, like, oh, it's like, oh, the marks are going to buy this anyway. They're going to buy the tickets. They're going to come sight unseen, not even knowing what the matches are. It's like they have it too easy, WWE. And they'll, they'll just do the same. They'll just what they're going to say is let's do the same thing we do for SmackDown and, and Monday Night Raw. We'll just, you know, do the we'll do a rematch or a, a triple threat match involving all the same matches that everybody saw last week. You know, or we'll 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 move. You know, point A to point from from point match A plus B is now A plus C, and B will be against D, and that will make everything entertaining for us. Well, you guys remember Survivor Series used to be one of the big four, one of the biggest events of the year, and you salivated. They got this team against. Then that we got team. the gobbledygooker. Yeah, they got the dream, this dream team of five guys, these big legends. Now, now they don't even tell you who's wrestling. It's just a no. meaningless pay per view. Meaningless. No, even... I know it'll get Evans' blood boiling. They had our friend uh, Claudio Castagnoli, uh, forget his character, Cesaro, job. He was in a tag match last Friday, jobbed. Yeah. Well, Can you well, believe the guy, the most talented, one of the most talented guys on their roster, one of the most talented wrestlers in this country. But Vince has gotten the message from him a long time ago that as long as he gets a paycheck, He's willing to do whatever Vince says. You know, he'll be gobbledygooker too. You know, he's, if, he's, a, he's a very laid back guy. He's not going to make waves. He's not going to complain. He's going to cash his check and uh, put on as good a match as he can under bad circumstances. But do whatever job Vince tells him to do. You know, it's that, unfortunately, that kind of, you know, leverage and loyalty, but it's not really loyalty. It's, you know, loyalty to the dollar. 
you know, it's not to Vince. It's it's because he pays them. You have to do what he says, or you're going to be shit canned. So there's not. I think that's the. And again, I say, is this not an uh, you know kind of embodiment of current corporate America? You know, and Jeff Bezos and and. But the thing, the thing is, the thing that that I keep hearing again and again is people will say all the corporations do this. Two wrongs th- don't make a right. Two thousand wrongs don't make a right. You know, again, again, some of these people are kids with a dream. They sign on the dotted line. They expect some kind of push. They expect some kind of marketing. And, and next thing they know, they're being let go. And you know, uh, creative has nothing for you. They're you don't well- see that with TV shows. TV shows, hit TV shows, whatever. Pick one, anyone. You could pick Saturday Night Live. And you don't have mass firings every three months. Yeah, they let go of the one guy who's a lemon. Uh, they're not going to let go of the you know three quarters of the guys. I mean, seventy-one people. That's a, seventy-one wrestlers. Not that's not even including. The behind the scenes guys. I mean, these are massive, massive. Um, you know, uh, I don't even know if you call layoffs because of the. Uh, you know, no, independent- you know, a lot of them. I can't understand this with the independent contractor bullshit status. Some of them, uh, covenant not to compete is cited, and they cannot go to any competition for three months, so they can't earn a living. And we haven't even discussed doing this just weeks before you know the holidays. Holidays. Get in- I was just thinking about that, too. Christmas. Thanksgiving, Hanukkah, and Christmas. What kind of a holiday season are these folks going to have, the shits? Absolutely. No, I mean, it, as I said, Vince gets to be Stooge the, uh, Scrooge the Stooge, you know, this time around, this the, this time of year. And again, not one dime well, he, less. Nick Khan is telling him to do. He's going along with it. So I wrote online that Nick Khan is the... Grinch who stole Christmas from the town. He's, he's the hatchet man. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but it's all, and again, Vince could easily take, you know, uh, uh, not even, uh, you know, no salary. He could just take less along with, with Stephanie McMahon taking less along with Shane McMahon taking less. And they'd have plenty of money easily to, to pay for uh, uh, all this town, or at least like, Half of the 71 people that they left. Or they could, you know, make NXT a more viable Fed, you know, instead of cutting the legs out. They had landing arenas. They were selling out within seconds. They were selling out their venues, like around WrestleMania and the big four pay-per-views, even though they're monthly, WWE is. And they got more audience response and enthusiasm, and they were selling out these venues and now they're just going to be doing their, you know, their quarterly big, what used to be pay-per-views, et cetera, shown on uh, Peacock, just in that little dinky, what they call the Capitol Wrestling Center there at the, at the training facility. So it's, it's no more. Can I want to change the subject just quickly, if it's okay with you guys, talk about loss. I want to throw out some non-wrestling names very quickly. Bill Luckett, who was a legendary Mississippi blues promoter, partnering with Morgan Freeman helping elevate artists, somebody I know you guys both know, if you hear Red Red Wine on the radio, the 80s band UB40 that went well beyond, they were still touring. Terrence Wilson, uh, known professionally as Astro, he died. Oh, and, wow, that's terrible. I did not hear that. I, 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 I actually, just a side note, growing up in, in Marin County, one of my best friends was, his name is Chris Allen, and one of his cousins was in the original UB40 like lineup. I think he left later, but I I was listening to UB40 in like 1978, 1979, well before it was cool to their demo tapes, to like their early early demo tapes and I was impressed at the sound then. I had no idea that, that he died. That's that's really That sad. Band, some of those guys came from I forget what the name of the band was and they were affiliated with Banana Rama, the female group. And then some of them went off and were part of the very... You know what UB40 stands for? This is a good trivia question. No, I don't. UB40 is like a a social security number. It's it's the unemployment benefit. Mm -hmm. So it was meant because these guys were all out of jobs and not working in musicians. And so that was kind of their little joke on on all of that to say UB40. 
No, nah, anyway, continue on. Uh, quickly, uh, I, I know I might have mentioned one of the names. Uh, these are all alleged. Well, Reggie Parks pretty much is well known. Super healthy guy. I was very close to him for decades. And I'll get into that very quickly in a sec. Uh, it, people were with him. They drove with him and traveled with him to, to the CAC in Vegas last month. No problems until he got there. Anyway, he caught COVID there, died. And, and this is just this Alleg spectrum. allegedly <laughs> he died. No, no, we know he died. They buried him. Meltzer, Meltzer and all the rest of them have written. Uh, all I got to say is that CAC, but CAC. also a West Coast indie wrestler named the Yeti, who was a really nice kid. I watched him. He wrestled at uh, quite a few shows, uh, not just in California, but in Arizona and Nevada. Tom Cusati, who was an East Coast fixture, I think born and raised in New York. He managed on Indies in Philly, Jersey, came out to Vegas, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, managed as the Penguin. He was the world's biggest Paul Heyman mark and a really funny, clever guy. He could imitate Heyman, but, you know, that's what he adopted in his style. And as he got heavier and lost his hair, he was doing a Penguin, you know, the uh, Danny DeVito Penguin, Batman. Batman, the second Batman movie. Anyway. He is Paul Heyman lost hair and got heavier. He resembled Tom Cusati. So Tom Penguin Cusati, same thing. We talked about that. And you know, again, allegedly, but people are saying, you know, that's the cause of death. And, uh, and then of course, uh, a, a real legend who main evented pretty much wherever he went. And he toured in Japan. I was sending slam, they actually uh, asked for some photos, so I, I sent him a photo of him reuniting with his Japan tag team partner. That's Angelo Moscow passed at, I think, 84, uh, with Stan Hansen, who he teamed with there. So it wasn't just Brody who Hansen teamed with or Snuka. It was also King Kong Mosca, who wrestled Mid-Atlantic, AWA. I get to see him when he came out to San Francisco when he was main eventing against Pat and Lonnie Main and Dean Ho. Uh, and, and so many others, Morocco before Morocco turned heel and, uh, was a super funny guy. He came to one cauliflower alley and I know Evan being the documentarian, uh, I was Barry Blaustein's image uh, still photographer for beyond the mat. And that was like 10 years of pre-production footage before he finally got to it. But at the 96, I keep bringing up cauliflower alley, but at the 1996 cauliflower alley where there was tons of talent. He had me get all of these legends and we went to the bar the night before the cauliflower thing began because it was only a one night CAC then uh, for the awards. And we had Ray Stevens, Pat Patterson, Bobby Heenan, Bockwinkle, Ernie Ladd, Ted DiBiase. And then there were some others watching like Von Raschke and George Steele and others just watching this. So Blastine had them all sitting smack dab together at the bar and Mosca was the most animated and he uh, he talked about, you know, uh, when he was trained for pro wrestling, when he came from the CFL Canadian Football League, he went to some major cooking culinary schools uh, courses and graduated. And then he roomed with Ray Stevens in the AWA. And Ray said, he's the most incredible cook. And all of these guys chimed in. And they said, yeah, we kept nagging him, cook for us, cook for us. Pat Patterson and Bachwinkle and, uh, you know, some of the others. Uh, wherever he went and, uh, you know, he'd make little lunches for the guys, you know, if they had long trips, he'd pack a lot of food and they just loved him. He was, it, it, sadly, this guy was so funny, so out there. And the photos I have that I sent to slam, he's like tearing his shirt off at the bar, showing his big hairy chest, popping buttons all over the place. But he, in the last X amount of years, he'd had, uh, Alzheimer's and some dementia and, uh, what a wild character he had a big fight with the cal berkeley uh player who then later became one of cal berkeley's most famous coaches that russ knows joe cap he had some war i don't know in his football days with joe cap and that made all the newspapers uh, x amount of years ago and i did a full column on that and uh, when i was still writing for the san francisco examiner and uh let me get your thoughts because i know evan saw him in the uh, tri wf angelo moss yeah. I saw him headline Madison Square Garden against Backlund, and then he um, also had a big feud with Pat Patterson. And every time I saw him for a big guy, you know, excellent matches. Guy gave 110%, good brawler, great heat. Um, you know, he, I, I, I enjoyed him. I mean, I, 
I never saw the guy in a bad match. Who managed him? I was trying to think. Was it the Wiz? I, I don't remember. I don't. I honestly don't remember. But um, he had a run with Backlund in all the arenas throughout the territory. Yeah. And Russ, I, I know he was maybe a little bit before your time, but he did work at the Cow Palace. I think he even had a match with Ray. You know, Ray would come in once or twice a year, maybe just once a year at times when he was you know full time with the AWA, and he loved Shire. But he had a match uh, uh, with Mosca and. You know, Mosca was just a huge name, Mid Atlantic. He worked with everybody there, Tony Atlas, and I think uh, I think for me, because I didn't see a lot of his work, and unfortunately, a lot of it isn't on video or available. He was just a little bit before my time. Yet he is one of the legendary names. I think he's one of those guys that when you talk about the history of Madison Square Garden. He'll be mentioned as one of the greats that wrestled there. I think, yeah, even though he wasn't the WWE champion, he was he contended for the title a lot of times, and a lot of those matches. Every were, every major arena in the territory he wrestled back when. Yeah, but I think he, his biggest matches were at Madison Square Garden. He fought Bruno a number of times, and no, uh, not Bruno, but or, not yeah. in New York. He fought Bruno in one of the other arenas I remember, but. Um, he was on top with Backlund, yeah, and yeah, and all in Toronto and Winnipeg. I think he had a match with Flair in Winnipeg and also Maple Leaf Gardens when they switched from the Sheik and all the Detroit, Ohio guys to the Mid Atlantic guys. And he came up there because he was part of Mid Atlantic then with Stud, team with Stud at Maple Leaf Gardens, had a match with Flair, had some matches with Steamboat and. Uh, some of the others, and uh, I think even Team with Slaughter, too. You know, Angelo pro- Mosca brings back a time where wrestlers were wrestlers primarily because they were tough guys, not because they were sculpted. I mean, certainly Mosca was as tough a human being as you could possibly put in a in, a, in the shell of a human body, but he was never a pretty boy he was not somebody that was sculpted like the ultimate warrior or we don't want that shit those guys actually for the most part i mean if you saw that dark side of the ring the last one the steroid trial and warlord is talking about you know he had to do his told and sculpt his body we didn't want to see that harley race never had a body and he could go legit hour legit 90 minute he body slammed andre the giant how strong do you have to be to lift someone up that's over 400 pounds he's cooperating with you but even then even then you've got to be able to hold 400 pounds up in the air at any point in time even if he's holding on to you and pressing himself up you have to support 400 pounds in the air. I know because I've tried to body. Have you actually, no offense, but have you actually tried to body slam somebody ever? Me, yeah. Because remember, I did some TV jobs and Roland, I don't know if you were coming to the APW no. gym wars, but I was a heel manager. So I had to take, I had to go to class. No, not I take a body to- slam. No, I give, I'm talking about giving a, a slam. Yeah. But I mean, that wasn't my it, role. It wasn't it's a wrestler. hard. It is extremely it hard work. Cooperating on the like, hands. That's why you see the hands on the shoulders, the hands on the chest of the guy getting slammed. He's helping. He's cooperating. Uh, I, but- I, I, when I was training, I, you know, I, I tried to do all that stuff, you know, vertical suplexes and all that other stuff. And I'm telling you, I never pulled more muscles in my body been yeah. going through about 15 minutes of pro ra- of, of wrestling training, you know, in an actual simulated match. I, I had I had pulled stomach muscles, pulled thigh muscles, pulled ankle and shin muscles. I mean, everywhere. It's in my arms, the back of my arms, the triceps, the biceps. My well, let's get my back to Andre. Hurt. Who's the first guy? Evan may know this. Who's the first guy ever to body slam Andre? And of course, this is way years before. Maybe it was a decade before he came to Inoki? WWE. Vince, no, Vince said, "Oh, on his TV, he's never was it been." Inoki? No, Evan. The first that slammed Andre, uh, maybe Don Leo Jonathan. You, Bing, Bing, Bing. You are correct. Yeah. Sir, oh, okay. Sir. I didn't In know. Montreal, wrong with you. Andre was Jean Ferré, based after a lumberjack a folk hero of Montreal. Yeah, the fairy. It wasn't pronounced. It was pronounced Ferré. But right, had, but he was on uh, TV. The it was fairy. No, it was never pronounced fairy. Ferre, F-E-R-R-E, in a French 
that was a, a actual lumberjack character but you know whatever and then vince senior didn't like that name so uh, you know monster and he did work under his last name in japan before he even went to montreal as monster rusimov but the andre the giant thing stuck and it served him well and uh yeah, I don't. Nobody's the attraction that guy. If you remember, Evan knows this better than anybody. The touring attractions. It started with Happy Humphreys, the women in the '40s, the what we called the midgets back then, the little people of wrestling, and then it became and Haystack Calhoun touring attraction. As was Man Mountain Mike, another huge guy they build is over 600, no closer to 480, like. Uh, Calhoun was but then Andre was the touring attraction of attractions well after gorgeous George who would tour you know he never stayed in one place that long but Andre is the greatest touring attraction ever even more so than Dusty Rhodes was a touring attraction during Evans time he's home base was Florida I remember that too Canada, yes it's Canada the Sheik's territory mid-Atlantic he went Dusty went everywhere Andre went totally everywhere Dusty and then, did not come to the west coast very much I, I don't remember he, Shire's very last U.S. champion when the last three Roy Shire cards. You remember the history of Roy Shire very quickly. He lost TV not once but twice. He lost Oakland for his TV tapings in 1970. And then around 76, 77, no, I'm sorry, 77, he lost his Sacramento TV, which the wrestlers hated driving to because it was a good two hours drive, depending on the night, from San Francisco. Uh, so then he switched to Don Owen, Portland wrestlers, and they would – send in their TV and Roy would use that and they'd have localized interviews and then Kansas city for a year, which was the shits. And finally the last three shows, he got it right. He had Eddie Graham's Florida TV and dusty came in. They, you know, bullshit and said it was the finals of this world tournament for the U S champion. And they had dusty beat Ole Anderson. I shot that at the cow palace. So dusty was the last holder of the U S title. And he was on the next subsequent two cards, including that fantastic, Battle Royal, Roy's last show that had both Funks, Harley, Dusty, and the year prior, those guys plus Gene Kaniski, five NWA, the current and the four former world champs, and then a slew of other guys like Ernie Ladd and Ron Starr. Nobody invited Mosca. That, uh, no, Mosca, that was earlier on. That was, uh, Mosca was in San Francisco, 74, 73, 74, with what was billed as the Brute. This was... Uh, I remember the brute. Gosh, I, you, he sent him to Vince Senior, and then Vince changed his name to Bugsy McGraw, and he that name stuck. And then, of course, he became a big hero and uh, all over the the. It, well, at his least, birthday, uh, I think. I think he just see? had his birthday this week. Bugsy, so, Bugsy, yes. nursing assistant. You know, he when he left wrestling, and I'd see him at these fan fest. He's like a male nurse, and I guess it's Tampa, or I think that's where he lives, Tampa. Yeah, it's a job with 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 job security. So, what what was your greatest? Now, what, you worked with Mosca on uh, 350 days, Evan. What was your experience working with him on on filming? Um, that was shot up in Canada, and I was not there for the um, for that shoot. So, um, but everybody just said he was a wonderful guy and very down to earth and. You know, just very hospitable, and they just raved about him. So, um, you know, we're proud to have, I would say at this point in 350 days, ballpark figure, 15 of our guys are gone. 15. Yeah, so. Um, and Superstar is probably not going to last forever. You know, well, nobody's going to last forever. But no, we're but, not going to last forever. But so, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, superstar Billy Graham is probably soon going to be on the list pretty he's soon. He's going to the hospital, Billy Graham, a lot. Before we forget about uh, the, uh, we want to pay our respects tonight. The show's mainly dedicated to Angelo Mosca and Reggie Parks and everyone else we've lost. But Angelo, yeah, that, Mosca, I just wanted to say too that that Cauliflower Alley uh, 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 meeting. Better. Super yeah, Spider? has now has now eclipsed the 2007 Russell Fan Fest for biggest wrestling disaster of a conference. Uh, I mean, of a, he died at that. Uh, that exactly, that, that one was just a scam. This one is is turned deadly. So well, you know, you know, uh, nobody wanted anyone to die. Let's preface it with that. But to push through a reunion when it's still not safe, it's unwise. All of the photos of people unmasked when. State law in Nevada, the governor had to issue that law. You're indoors, you have to wear a mask at all times. And all those photos we saw online, 
particularly the two nights of the wrestling show, because it's a near four day thing indoors at that antiquated old hotel. And sometimes you're in small lecture rooms, you know, just insane. And nobody in those photos that I saw online, just barely a few, but none of the post shots, the f- photos where the photographers behind the people, the, all the fans watching the matches, nobody's masked. Well, nobody's- I wanted to also kind of bring up, I don't know if you heard it all about the Travis Scott disaster that happened yeah, I heard about that. in Eight Houston. Died and, uh, I, I, who told them to rush the stage? Did how, how culpable or guilty is Travis Scott? I don't think he... He didn't say anything. He just kept going while people were passing out and dying in droves right in it's front like of him. Altamont. It's like Altamont with the Hells Angels, the Stones concert that turned into a huge fiasco. And Altamont right there in our backyard in Northern California. I've been to thousands and thousands of concerts um, over nearly 50 years and uh, nobody's ever died. I mean, how complicated is it? You know, but I think that people like over two years haven't gone to any live events and they're beginning to like lose their ability to remember how to act civilized now when they get into a mass, you know, crowd situation. And and you're just seeing more of it. You're seeing it in the NBA with fans and running onto the, the court and trying to punch refs and players you're seeing in major league baseball there was a record number of people running onto the field in the last year there's people running onto football fields in college and in pro games i'd like to see you do that with like a t-shirt for the show get us some yeah exactly free pub unfortunately they are or fortunately they're not showing these things on tv on purpose because they don't want copycats and people to feel oh well that's how you can get famous but I just see that, I see that like people are not being able to behave well. I've also heard that at some WWE shows, some of the crowds are really like outrageous. Oh, so they're you getting know? mad. They're getting mad that even at house shows, the thought police are coming up from WWE, the in-house security, and telling them to sit down, uh, taking their signs away. That are I, I'm surprised. There was a sign, and somebody kept moving around. It was a sign whenever they had the Drew McIntyre out. A sign, the guy had it, Drew sucks. And you would see the guy, like, moving around so he wouldn't get caught. But there is a backlash. People are really now resenting that or and maybe acting out against being told. That, like at AEW, Tony Khan doesn't care. He has those Dave LaGreca heads. Those things were busted open radio. He has signs pro con. He doesn't care. He just wants the fans to have a good time. He's got the right attitude about it. And that's why they're out drawing. They outsell WWE uh, quicker. And, and some of these venues, you know, more so, so where they don't have the darkened parts of the venue that don't have people in them. I, I should say this too, though, uh, you know, not so much playing devil's advocate on, on the CAC in Vegas, but, they had to know people are desperate. They hadn't seen their friends. The wrestlers hadn't seen their friends. And they're getting older because CAC skews older. So, But to have that, you, you would have to know that fans would be getting desperate and would want to come. So don't hold it. Wait until it's safe. The, you know, great. I mean, there was that letter that we talked about online last year where uh, the guy from Canada wrote, you know, I don't want to go to a CAC and I, you know, what, whatever he wrote, I urge you not to, too, until it can be a real CAC to where we can shake hands, hug each other, all of that stuff. But, in, you know, it's not safe to do that. So it should be postponed. And it was last year, but it wasn't postponed for a fourth time as it should have been last month. And the result of this were people catching COVID and allegedly a ton getting in ICUs. We still are hearing Charlie Smith and his wife are in ICUs after I don't know how many weeks uh, and and various uh, alleged deaths and people writing about these deaths as being caused from these folks attending CAC, really wanting to see their brothers. I mean, I have so many great Reggie Park stories. I'll leave you with this one. We're at a Red Bastine, Texas shootout reunion in Dallas at Red's wife, Carol's uh, hotel. She owned a hotel there, actually in Fort Worth, you know, right near Dallas, part of the that Metroplex. And uh, the night before the thing started, it was a two night deal, but I'm sitting there with my pal Reggie Parks and Leo Garibaldi and his wife and Bastine 
and a few others. Tex McKenzie are trying to sing karaoke very badly, and it was boring. And Reggie looks at me, and he goes, Mike, let's get the F out of here and go to a titty bar. Yeah. We go. And then we get back, you know, and uh, we're at the bar with Johnny Valentine and Maurice Vachon, Mad Dog Vachon, and Killer Carl Cox, and Mike Pedusis, who Evan will remember is a great underneath guy in Tri-WF. And they all heard it, and they go, man, we should have gone with you guys. And and Reggie had the biggest smile on his face as he was paying for all these lap dances. And he had the most fun. And that was the type of guy. He was a fantastic wrestler, wrestled in Japan. He wrestled in Europe, all over the U.S., you know, Omaha boy. But his big claim to fame in the U.S. primarily was St. Louis and, of course, the AWA. And then he became the champion belt maker. Every organization, starting in the 80s, Vince had belts made by Reggie Parks. NWA, WCW, ECW. They were he, awesome. They were awesome belts. They were was, so best. And who succeeds in two things? That's like Adrian Street, who, you know, big wrestling career, but also he's like one of the world's foremost experts on repairing and making Ferris wheels and collecting and being a historian of Ferris wheels. So it's great when these folks can transition. Buddy Satello is an expert on uh, repairing Ferris wheels. Did you know yeah. that? He was Contact. a attorney, Contract. and wrestle attorney. So, yeah, he's got, you know, those two lives. And he still is part of wrestling. Well, I, I also, because we have a few minutes left, um, unless, Evan, you wanted to add something in our, our Yeah, I just, I just want to I just want to throw in that today's the third anniversary of the death of our friend Dale Pierce, uh, who um, was uh, a wrestler, manager, writer, historian, uh, public speaker, um, a teacher, I mean, just a, a real renaissance man. And, uh, you know, he, he worked different territories, especially Arizona, Ohio. So he's not a household name. He never made a time traveler. The time traveler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, just a great guy. And he loved wrestling and he devoted his life to it. So I just wanted to mention him on the third anniversary of his passing. And he was a good friend of, you know, Mike's and, and myself. And, he and I were your columnists amongst your columnists. Yeah, were... Oh, yeah. I mean, Dale, you know, I owe a lot to the uh, just uh, selfless, selfless. It was never about money. He's like, Evan, I'll write whatever you need. He was just tons of stuff, you know. Hey, hey Mike, you know, three days from now was when Mark Smith died. Mm. It'll be ten years. Yeah. Hard to really believe. Bison Mark, Smith. Bison Mark Smith was a huge superstar in Noah. He was big, you know. Maybe not as well known outside of APW and the West Coast, but man, he was a superstar. I saw him in New York with ROH. He was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forgot ten about years. Yeah. Ten years. Can you believe it? Can you believe he's been gone ten years? It doesn't seem like ten years. And when I think about how I never imagined that he would die before me. You know, he was a colossus. He was in amazing shape. He didn't do drugs or steroids or anything, which a lot of people have accused him of, you know, without knowing the truth. But it was always a congenital heart defect that he had. And the, his father had... Basketball was, players. So you hear a lot about basketball players dying the same way. Yeah, and he, he always said he thought he was going to die early. And... Um, just wanted to make an impact while he was around and he did make an impact he made an impact on me because he was my friend and he'll always be my friend and 10 years is too long for the world to have existed without mark smith and i miss him every day evan is it like 10 years since tiger how long has it been since tiger passed try 16 years wow. 15 16 years man the years fly by um yeah, when you introduced me to him he was such a nice guy yeah yeah 33 years old what happens the older we get into our 50s and 60s um and hundreds the, hundreds hopefully we know so many people that passed that every time you go online they go oh today's the anniversary of nikolai's death today's the birthday of uh, Johnny Valiant. Today's the anniversary of Nicole Bass's death. And you just it's just like you're constantly grieving. It's like you're just reminded constantly. Well, and remember that saying, I forget who said it, if you stop talking about somebody, they're dead. So it's good that people are talking. Even on Howard Stern show, every year they remember uh, when Nicole Bass passed away because she was a huge part of that show. 
Yeah, and um, my uh, I, I spoke to uh, my production guy. And my book will be out shortly. All the pictures are done. Now he's on the text, and the text is the easy part because with me, there's not a lot of editing. Just the, some commas here and some semicolons there. So well, what I'd like to start doing is, if you'd like to, when your book is ready for uh, for purchase. If you could, you know, every week give us a little snippet from oh, the Oh, yeah, book. absolutely, like absolutely. And and like we were just saying, um, <laughs> I, there's a hundred stories in this book. I would guesstimate off the top of my head a third of them are on people who passed. So there's always going to be another anniversary. I could acknowledge somebody and read a snippet, but uh, um, which isn't to make it all grim, sound grim either. There's seven pieces on the making of the wrestler, which have never seen the light of day. Some uh, real, um, you know, behind the scenes stuff. You've shared some passages with me, and it's extremely well written. I yeah. mean, it's it's something that I think anyone who's a fan of wrestling, or just your life in general, or just you know New York in general. Yeah, and the book, the book is in all wrestling, so. Um, yeah. Anyway, not, I'm I'm really not here to hype the book. I was just acknowledged yeah. Dale. Yeah. Th- no, I appreciate it, but uh, you know, Dale's in the book also. I just wanted to acknowledge all these great people we've met and worked with, and uh, yeah, D- Dale was like a true Renaissance man. Like the stuff he knew, like nobody knows. Like like he was an expert on bullfighting. He was an expert on spaghetti westerns. He was an expert on Wild West gunfighters. Like like just crazy stuff like like nobody knows. This guy knew, you know? Well, that's that's sad that, you know, we had a number of, of passings and anniversaries to, to think about. And now we have to add Angelo Mosca onto the list too. But uh but let me just let me just say one thing. The beauty of it is a guy like Mosca, I had a buddy over today and we were, we were just like on YouTube and there, there he was, Mosca from the Mid-Atlantic, you know, in a good match. And these guys live forever. I mean, they really do have a piece of immortality. They're always going to be entertaining people. And, uh, you know, I'm watching, I'm watching Mid-Atlantic with my buddy and it's like, I would say half those guys are dead from the 80s. Easy, right, right, Mike? Wrestling better than a lot of the stuff, at least let's just say WWE, because all the other stuff is great. Of course, but I'm just saying there's Piper, there's Dusty, there's Ernie Ladd, and I'm like, they're all gone. I'm a, I, I, and I'm having this conversation with my friend as we're watching it, you know, and there's Mosca who's gone now. So, and, and I got to go, but what drove me nuts on that busted open show, the host, I think it was Mark Henry, was saying the very first king of pro wrestling was jerry lawler no it wasn't it was ernie ladd and then like a year later ernie ladd like around 69 70 and he bobby shane. and bobby shane they yeah. were the kings well before you know lawler not to put down lawler at all and and then somebody else some fan called in and swore it was harley race no he won a king of the ring tournament in like 87 that was 20 or years later yeah yeah, no, no. I mean, Lawler's in that echelon, but it was... Some hurt. people do think history begins when they observed it, not when... I actually happened. think Jackie Fargo wrestling as Budney Rogers, I believe, for uh, uh, the, the shyster Jack Pfeffer promoter in the late 50s. He had a crown, right? He had a crown, too. Yeah. I don't know if he called himself the king of wrestling, but he had a crown, whereas Ernie Ladd called himself the king of wrestling, Bobby Shane, and, and then tertiary wise it would be jerry lawler who probably i think did it the best bobby shane was great but his life was cut short by that plane crash but yeah lawler was fantastic but wasn't the first well people are always making claims but few can actually back it up and while there's still wrestling historians out there they won't be able to oh, get and away. i wanted to mention amsterdam Moscow's son cfl great and also he was a pro wrestler for a number of years particularly in the toronto area Moscow was a king. He was King Kong, but he was a king. I like to point out that technicality. And he had and a he, match with King Kong uh, Bundy and a match with King Kong Brody. They're the oh, yeah. Battles of the King Kongs. Absolutely. No Absolutely. Godzilla wrestlers. I don't know why there's never been a Godzilla wrestler. There's Luchasaurus, but not a Godzilla wrestler. But Godzilla keeps doing turns like the big show. He's turned like 37 times also. One movie's heel, one movie's face. 
Yeah, uh, you know, his character died forever when they had that baby Godzilla that that sort of slapped Gadzuki. Gadzuki. Oh, so, oh, so. I want to know who the mom was. Who was the mom? That was an Mothra. Immac- no, she, it's Immaculate she, Conception. Mothra sued for child support, and and Godzilla won custody. So yeah, that's, Godzilla's that's right. sixty-eight, but sixty-eight is the new forty-eight. He, he's aged well. <laughs> the he, I guess it's a he. Yeah, we, not, the, yeah, you never really get that down either. You know, it's uh, no one's lifted him upside down to check. You know, anyway, guys, <laughs> it's been a great show. Hopefully, we'll have a little bit more fun. You know, no, nobody dies next week that we have to put in the ground. They die can... every week. That's like the, the running theme of this show. Every week, somebody drops so. dead. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. so. But but otherwise, it's been great to have you this week, and we'll see everyone next week. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Give your Japanese quote. There you go. Couldn't have said it better myself. Good night.